What is up, everybody, and welcome to the All NBA Show, part of the All City Podcast Network. I'm your host, Adam Marez. I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Tim Legler. Legs, the final week of the NBA season got off to a hot start last night. 14 games, almost all of them were meaningful and good. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. I, I, it was the most meaningful night of the NBA season to this point. Like, ton of stuff up for grabs, a lot of moving parts. Virtually every game except one had some sort of impact, pretty much the whole league was playing, and every game except one had some impact, Spurs-Grizzlies being the only game that didn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but there were a lot of ones that did, including the game we're going to start with, which is the 76ers and Joel Embiid played 36 minutes and dominated. We're going to talk about them because I am buying all of the 76ers stock. I think they have a great path. We're going to talk about that, but we're also going to get into about 10 games today so we're going to have a lot to talk about uh and you're going to get a lot of information on the show but first we are presented as always by DraftKings Sportsbook stay tuned because you're going to hear more about what DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show DraftKings the crown is yours all right let's get into it top story we have so much to talk about today top story the 76ers beat down the Detroit Pistons that's not a big story everybody beats down the Detroit Pistons but what is a big story is Joel Embiid played 36 minutes which is an enormous amount for him, goes for 37 points, 11 rebounds, eight assists, three steals, two blocks, is a plus 17 in this game. That's a great stat sheet. But he looked to me really healthy in a lot of ways, really confident in a lot of ways. His passing game was incredible. To me, I, he looks twice as good as I expected him to look when he went out for as long as he did and was coming back this late in the season. What did you see from him, Legs? Uh, I completely agree. I, I was saying to you right before we came on, we were just kind of prepping, and I just said, "I it's a it is amazing that he missed as much time as he did to look this good immediately." I mean, it's, it's incredible, and 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 I understand that it, it is a different kind of era, like in terms of how they treat injuries, and guys are like really getting to a hundred percent beyond yeah. even <laughs> by the time they come back, they don't sort of work their way back in, you know. I can give you 15 and eight tonight and maybe like a week from now I can be back close to my normal averages. They don't take the court till they're ready to go. So I get that, but it doesn't matter. He's a big dude that traditionally has had problems with stamina um, and everything else. And he has come out and he did that first game. Certainly he about blacked out uh, because of the lack of <laughs> oxygen that night in his first game back. It was actually kind of funny to watch like how badly he was gasping for air at one point um but quickly has played himself into what looks like to me cl a lot closer to normal game shape and the numbers he's putting up the efficiency it's remarkable man and as a result of him being injected into this playoff situation here at the last minute with super fresh legs and combined with some of the issues some of these other teams have had that we thought could possibly, you know, grab that void that was sitting there below the Boston Celtics it hasn't really happened for any of those teams. So as yeah. a result, you know, he comes back from this injury, man, and who knows what he could have been looking at in terms of an uphill battle. I don't see it as that big of an uphill battle anymore. Now, I don't know what's going to happen here, Adam. I, I just was looking and I, I quickly glanced through it, so I might have missed a game. According to what I just saw in their schedule, they've lost two out of three to the Pacers. I believe I, – I don't think I missed one. Maybe Emma could check on that while we're talking here. If that's the case, uh, and they don't play them, right, the last two games, no. So they're, they're not going to win the tiebreaker, and right now they're a game back, which means they're two games back. So they're not catching them, um, which is a big deal because that's for the sixth spot. And you get to the sixth spot, you know, you don't have to worry about these, these, you know, these play-in situations. They're probably going to be a play-in team, and they're probably going to play the Miami Heat. That's what it looks like it's going to happen at home. Most likely, if they could win their last two games, they will be at home for that game. I like their chances. And if they win that, 
they get into the seventh spot, man, which they're going to end up most likely playing the Bucks. And I'm telling you, you know, it's crazy to say, I think I would pick the Sixers to win that series, assuming nothing crazy here happens in the last couple of games. Well, I, I almost want to couch that for a moment because I want to stay on this game because I'm with you. It's not just a belief in the 76ers. It's a, a – you doubt everybody else because of injuries and different things. But let's stick on this game because I want to talk about what Embiid has been so great at this year. His jump shooting this season, especially on those long jumpers, is just at a whole yeah. other level. And I don't know if that's the number one thing you would want to be confident in. You want him, you know, he's good at all the other aspects of the game and the playoffs. You want him getting into the paint and doing those things. I think he's been good at that. But that jumper and the way that he clears space, like he's gotten so good. Like he'll stand 16 feet from the basket and just throw his arms out there every time you try to get close. And he does it a couple times and you have to back up and you're trying to be careful. And then he shoots it and he's just so comfortable with it. So last night, he wasn't dunking the ball. He was getting to the rim. And that's the one thing if you look at, say, okay, maybe there's a little fatigue or lack of explosiveness. But his jumper right now, he looks like the best jump shooter from 16 feet in the NBA. And that's how you get to 37 points is it's so deadly. There's nothing you can do on that. And that's the foundation. I almost feel like that jumper, the straight on 17, 16, 17 foot jumper is the foundation of his game. And it's such a strong foundation because he never misses it. No, he doesn't miss it, and he can get it whenever he wants. And it's an area of the floor also that makes it very difficult to to run traffic at him. Like You can't double a guy that's standing there facing up at 18 feet, facing the basket somewhere between the elbows or off the short wing. Like It's impossible. You're literally running right at a guy that's already facing you. That's that size that, you know, I would have said early in his career, first two or three years, he would not necessarily have made the right read. He's gotten a lot better at where that ball is supposed to go. So he can see it coming and he's better at, at, at understanding where the ball should go. So you can't, it's a tough place to double. He's way easier to double when he backs guys into the post or he catches it deep. You can, you can, you can actually bother him then. Very difficult, man, when he's going to sit there at 18 feet. And by the way, you know, the guys that are playing him, a lot of times are are smaller, but despite the fact they're smaller and should be laterally quicker, they're afraid to like jam up on them because his first step is quick and he's so big and strong that once he gets next to you, you are going to foul him. It's a guarantee when he goes to the rim from 18, 19 feet. You're going to foul him if he gets a step on you. So guys kind of sort of halfway – play him they halfway close out they don't really fully get there and he's going in i'm in a perfectly comfortable space here mentally i can shoot this shot whenever i want his touch defies logic for a guy that big strong with those with the hands you know that are ginormous to shoot a ball that that is like that soft all the time like it's just amazing to me his touch on the on this shooting so i agree with you by the way since he came back uh, and this you know stamina a lot of times you're affected at the foul line when you're coming back from an injury, your legs aren't quite there. Like you're just tired. He's 35 for 40 from the line since he came back. And like, he's <laughs> always been a great foul shooter, but, and it's such yeah. a weapon in, in, you know, in meaningful games. Cause it's like, there's no strategy to like, well, I'll put him on a line and right. see what happens. Like, I still think that's even, that's, that's even a decent way to play Luca sometimes, although he's gotten better this year. It's not a surefire thing. Giannis, obviously it's not a surefire thing. And bead that's money, man. You want to foul him? It's 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 like guaranteed two points. So his touch and his shooting, I agree, separate him and make him. I think Luca is the best offensive player in the NBA in totality of what he does offensively. And Bede is the best offensive player in the Eastern Conference. I, I he might be the best player in the Eastern Conference. I mean, you know, with all respect to Giannis, we'll see what happens. That matchup might come, but at his best this season and really last season and this season at his best he's looked like the best player in that conference and he looks like it right now the explosiveness the stamina will be a question uh even just the ability to stay healthy will be a question those things are almost always a question for him but right now i just we we expected more of a ramp up and he looks like he could go into any series in the eastern conference and outplay the other team's best player and that is as we all know that's more than half the battle in a playoff series the other guy I want to talk about is DeAnthony Melton, who returned. He's had a kind of a, a star-crossed year, has missed basically the entire 2024 portion of this season. He's played a couple spot games here or there. Back injury, but 16 minutes last night, he returns to the lineup. Here's why I think he's so important. One, defensively, 
the 76ers need to round out their rotation. They need to have full guys. Defensively, he provides that. But offensively, he provides a nice pick and roll, or really it's more of a dribble handoff partner with Embiid, like a secondary one, which your starters are going to play a lot of minutes. You're going to get a lot of maxi Embiid in the playoffs. But you have to stagger some. And that means you're going to have to play some minutes without Maxi on the court and Embiid in a playoff series, and you can't have too big of a drop-off. And Melton, to me, is a really good like connective player. He's not a great point guard or any of that stuff, but he can fill in in staggered minutes and keep Embiid getting the ball and keep playing off and keeping the defense off honest. So him returning to the lineup this late in the season, it's huge for them, and he's a huge X factor in my opinion. What do you think? Totally agree with you, and I'll, I'll I'll even take it a step further, and I'll include him in this mix. This is the fir- more than any other year since Joel Embiid's been in the NBA, we are going to appreciate and talk about his role playing supporting cast. Now, I think we're clearly going to talk about his co star in a positive way more than and, and then what he's dealt with in the past with Harden and Simmons as the two co stars that he had. And Max, he's a different level player. I don't think he's going to be affected by the pressure of any of these situations. I think he's going to deliver, uh, and I think Embiid gets a lot of confidence from the way Maxi plays. I think it, I think it, it lifts his spirits, but beyond that, there are other guys that are going to have significant contributions in these games once they get into the playoffs that we're going to be talking about more than any supporting cast that he's had. And I'm talking about guys like Buddy Heald who is he hasn't really played with uh, since right. you know just recently since he came back from the injury. And ma- major reason why they got Buddy Heald is because they thought Embiid was coming back at some point. Um, to make a playoff run this year, they needed another shooter that can play off of all the attention he gets. Boom, there's Buddy Heald. He goes five for nine from the three last night as, as evidence of that. Kelly Oubre Jr. is a perfect fit on this team for a guy that can get his own shot. He's athletic. He's got no conscience. Like he's He can score to basketball. He plays hard defensively. Um, we're going to talk about guys like that. The Anthony Melton is another one. And then Nicholas Batum is another guy that's going to be important for them in the postseason. Man, his length – and, and the guys he's going to have to guard defensively, and he didn't make any threes last night. He didn't get a lot of shots. He only took four shots, didn't make any threes. But he is the kind of guy that is capable when you get go up against a team in a playoff series that's going to specifically try to find ways to take the ball out of Embiid's hands. They're going to be corner threes galore for certain guys. Nicholas Batum is one of those players that on a given night in a playoff game, I'm telling you, yeah. he's going to make six threes. He's going to make six threes. He's going to be a huge difference maker because they're going to be, for the most part, naked looks. And he's already really big, and he can, you know, that's his favorite shot. He's going to have a big factor, and then he also can guard, you know, a Jason Tatum, a Jalen Brown. He can guard a Giannis. Like if it gets to that point, that level, he can guard those types of players. Um, You know, a Jimmy Butler, like whoever it may be, that's an elite offensive player. Batum can give you some of that, and he's going to have these nights where he strings together some three-point shots and he's a major factor. So I agree with you about Batum. You know, he's he's a huge X factor for them, as is Melton. To me, though, they have two players, and you mentioned one of them, but they have two players to me that are so trick-or-treat, and they're so key to them having success. And one of them is Tobias Harris, who was the good version last night, 15 points, 12 rebounds, 4 assists. He was great. I mean, it was the Detroit Pistons. But Kelly Oubre, you mentioned, and – I know from earlier in the year how high you are on him and how much you like this fit. But to me, he's still a guy where on a night by night basis, the highs and lows are so extreme. And he's so it sounds like you have more trust than I do in him because I love him in his good games. But I just feel like he's a guy that I think you're going to play a seven game series and you're going to get four good and three bad from him. Well, here's what I'll say to that. He just played a 20 game stretch and he's averaging 20 points a game in a 20 game stretch. And that's not a small sample size. He's shooting 38% from the three uh, in April. He shot. He did not shoot the ball well from three in March, but he still put up good scoring numbers. Um, he's shooting about 50% from the field this month. Four out of the five games, he's been over 50% from the field. So I, I feel like I feel like he's going to be there. You know, he might not have great shooting nights. I do feel like he's going to be in that 15 to 20 range most nights in the playoffs. I think you can count it. I don't actually rely on Tobias Harris at all. And I don't think anybody (laughs) in Philadelphia does. I think they're expecting Tobias Harris to not show up in the playoffs. And that's why having guys like Heald and Oubre and even a guy like Batum, who's going to make spot on threes is very important because in the past it was like, man, you know, you'd have, Harden or Simmons, like really losing confidence. Then you'd have Embiid usually hurt or 
or body just getting down like in, in the course of a series. So it's like, well, hey, we still have Tobias, man. That's a $30 million player, right? And then Tobias will go 0 for 7, like in a big spot. So, man, are, are you gonna, hold on a second, because I hear this all the time from our Sixers, you know, our Sixers coverage. They are so tough on Tobias Harris. Do you really? Because I feel like you're being almost too tough. He has good games, Legs. He has big yeah, time I'm not games. saying he never has good games. What I'm saying to you is, man, and you can go back. We can go back if you want. I'll pull up his playoff game log. Well, yeah, we can go. We can go game features. by game, and you can see like there's nights when when they you know when maybe and look yeah you want your star to be great every night in the playoffs right you wanted yeah. to be Jokic you wanted to be Luca you wanted to be that but very few guys are LeBron very few guys do it every single game in the playoffs right most guys there's, there's peaks and valleys and beads like that too. So you want like on those nights, man? Can, can this be a night when Embiid gives you sixteen, and he and he and he's not playing well, and he gets in foul trouble, whatever? Can this be the night, Tobias? I get twenty four out of you. Like we really need. You're capable. We need it. And he just seems like he never was able to do that. Deliver that moment when they needed you to to raise your game. I'm not saying he's a terrible player. I'm not saying he never shows up. And he's been and he's been very good for throughout his career in the regular season. His numbers are very good. Yeah. shoots officially and puts up consistent numbers he has had spots in the postseason for the sixers on nights when he could have been maybe the difference man because some other guys were struggling and he just had a hard time grabbing that you need him to be great every night you need maxi to be good at you know six out of seven games almost every night and then you have so many guys that can step up you mentioned Ubre, tobias harris batum Melton, they just have a lot of options for guys that can make the impact on a night by night basis on either end of the floor or on both ends. But let's go through it now. They're the seven seed. You don't think they'll catch the Indiana Pacers. So if they're going to be a seven seed, you got to beat the Miami Heat, first of all, in a playoffs or in a play in. I think that is a harder task than, than you would guess just because it's a one off game. MB hasn't been back for that long. He played 36 minutes last night. But 36 minutes against the Pistons is not 36 minutes against the Miami Heat. Those are a different 36 True. minutes. And in a play-in, he's probably going to have to play maybe 40 minutes. You might have to get to 40 minutes that night just to, to, to grab the win. So first of all, let's just – we're talking about their path. Do you like that? Do you feel confident that they would go uh, – that they would host Miami and come out with a win so they don't have to go to a second play-in game? I feel very confident of that. And, and look, if this was a normal Heat – team for me i might yeah. feel differently because the history between them jimmy butler seems to be a guy that likes to torture them a little bit it would be in philly i don't feel i feel like the heat are missing something man they just they don't they don't i don't have that vibe with them at all philadelphia gets that game at home and you got Embiid this fresh from you know the time off that he had i have so much faith in maxi to play huge in a game like that no i like philadelphia to win that game to get the seven, and then, like I said, it looks like most likely going to play the Bucks. I don't know what the Bucks Knicks tiebreaker is. Um, Nick Bucks are up one game on them. They each have three games to play. I'm not sure where how that plays out. So maybe the Knicks still have a shot to catch them. I don't know. But right now, Bucks went out. They get they get two. You know that's how you have to kind of look at it. And so if that's Philadelphia and the Bucks. You know, I actually like Philadelphia in that series as well, but just, you know, you can't get there without winning that game. And look, even if they lose that game, they then play the winner of Chicago Atlanta at home. They're winning yeah. that game. They're winning that game. So Yeah, but that's the Celtics, though. If you get the true, Celtics, but now you get it, now one. you're an eight seed against Boston and your your season's gonna end. That's why, that's why, and I, I started saying this before we even came back and looking at it, it is critical, like it is absolutely imperative that the 76ers get the seven spot. And whether that means, you know, you go on the road to, to play Miami in that game or you play that game at home, you got to win that game, man. you got to get the seven spot to avoid the Celtics as long as you can, particularly the way that the Bucs have been playing. I know they got a good win last night, but it was a very weird game. And who knows what's going on with Giannis now with the calf. So talk about that's the, the spot, man. That is the coveted spot in the East. Get the seven and avoid the Celtics as long as you can. Well, your point about, I mean, we'll get to the Milwaukee Bucks here in a second, but Giannis does go down last night with a non-contact injury. We should get an update today. There is a very scary scenario. Anytime a guy goes down the way he did, grabs for his back of his leg, back you know in the Achilles area, you hold your breath. So we'll find out. But even if he's not hurt major, you know, so he sees an end of surgery, it looks like it might be something that's just lingering. So Or, or something yeah. that's okay, a strained calf is not like a nothing injury. 
So if you have a Bucks team that's not playing well, and you have a Giannis who is anything less than 100% physically, you know, you go into that series and you say, okay, 76ers, Bucks, Giannis and beat at full strength. Straight. You could make a case for Embiid being the best player in that series. Embiid versus Giannis hobbled. Okay, now you have a chance. And anytime you get that, there's something there. And that Bucks team, as you've mentioned, there's just something off about them. So should you get to a 7 2 scenario? Usually 7 2, you feel like, okay, that's almost hopeless. It takes a miracle. I don't think so. I think that series in my mind would almost look like a coin flip and i would probably pick philly so right off the bat we're going through this it's tough to win a one-off game against anybody especially miami but we like philly winning that one if you were to go that 7-2 and it was the milwaukee bucks how would you view that series i'd pick philadelphia to win the series i can tell you right now barring you know anything crazy happening here in these last few games to, to, to samadhi for philly because I, I must i must say something else not only will you have the most dominant player in the series in Embiid, and I think he would be in that series. I got news for you, man. There's every reason to think Tyrese Maxey could outplay Damian Lillard. Ooh. I mean, do you do you doubt it? I don't. I don't. I, this is not to me. This has not been close to the best version of Damian Lillard that we've oh. seen throughout his career um, since he got there. He's had nights and he's had moments, but ironically, you know, one of the things I thought he was going to answer was this the, their issues at the end of a game, particularly with Giannis having to do everything, like coming from the top of the key with a live dribble. Like that's the way I felt like they handled every situation when Budenholzer was there. Just isolate Giannis at the top of the key and let him go. He's running people over and he's trying to make plays at the rim. And you know he wasn't good enough foul shooter that you could trust him in that situation. So I thought, oh, wow, they went out and got the perfect guy for that because that's what Damian Lillard is known for, closing games, game time. Here we go. They have one of the worst records in close games since Doc Rivers got there since Doc Rivers took over the team, despite the fact that they have Damian Lillard on the roster. So so even if his numbers weren't as good, if he was still great in those situations, do you say, okay, then that, that's all that really matters in that series? I'm not, I'm not sure. And I think Maxi in a seven-game series, absolutely statistically could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Damian Lillard without question. And then if Embiid outplays Giannis or if he's the best player in the series, there you go, man. Philadelphia's going to win the series. I, and look, Milwaukee's done nothing to convince me that they've got their issues worked out defensively, that they could deal with Embiid and deal with Maxi yeah. and deal with this team. I think Philadelphia would be so confident in that series. I think he may be even more confident than if they played a team like the Knicks, honestly, because yeah. the Knicks are going to grind you down to death to what they're going to do to you defensively and the way they're going to play you. I don't think anybody thinks Milwaukee's capable of doing that. They're not shutting anybody's water off. They're going to trade baskets, and Philadelphia feels like, well, we've got two guys that can carry this series. So I, I personally, I would favor Philadelphia in that. I think Milwaukee looks incredibly vulnerable right now, incredibly fragile. Like everything is being held together just a, just a tiny bit because they're in that slump. You've got the Doc Rivers aspect of this. You got now you have Giannis's potential injury. It's so precarious with them that I feel like that's a series you get. And then you have the Doc Rivers, you know, Philadelphia angle of all this that they face off and you drop game one. I just feel like they are a team that you can set the tone early and take control of that series in a way that is, you know, greater than most 7 2 matchups. So that's why I like them in the series. And then if you do go to the next round, you know, that puts you opposite side of the bracket as Boston. So you get a second round now to ramp up. And I think the Knicks, in a lot of ways, are a perfect tune-up now the knicks can beat them the knicks are so good they're so tough they're going to grind you down they can absolutely beat philly as could milwaukee but if you get to that one it feels like a great tune-up where once again you have the most dominant player uh on the court in joel Embiid, and that one to me would prepare them nicely for a celtic series so just real quick the path the knicks in the second round for 76ers would you feel confident if you're philly yeah, but that's that that that's a war, man. And like you said, that's a 50-50. That could go either way. At the end of the day, I and Bede, I'm going with Embiid in that. Now, look, I want to say this. And 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 I see some people in the chat also feel this way. It, it is a little bit of a reach to give Joel Embiid as much benefit of the doubt as I'm giving him right now. And maybe you are too. It, it is based on some of the things that have happened to him in the playoffs. Between yeah. injuries and 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 poor performances, it's fair. But telling you, I, I I really believe in it, man. The psychological aspect of what he was dealing with, with with Simmons and Harden, you can't really overstate the impact that that had on him.
Now, that's then maybe say, hey, you're a star, rise above that. It's great. That's fair. I agree with you on that. I'm just telling you, some things are excuses, some things are reasons. I'm telling you it affected him. And I think Maxi has the opposite effect on him. Now, having said all of that, Adam, I'm telling you right now, if Joel Embiid is, is, stays healthy, there's no, no setbacks at all, and, he, and they played the Milwaukee Bucks in a first-round series, and he does not show up. He averages 19, shoots 45 from the field. They lose to the Bucs. I'm telling you, this is probably the last time I will ever give Joel Embiid the benefit of the doubt because it, it, this, it's, I think that this is his best chance with this team and the state of the Eastern Conference. And when I say best chance, I'm talking about to get to the Conference Finals, to get to yep. the Conference Finals. He hasn't been there. That, that, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Not to get to the finals because there's clearly a better team. You can't expect Joel Embiid to beat the Boston Celtics. That's the best team in the East by a lot. They have a 15-game lead on the Eastern Conference, all right? I'm talking about to get to the conference finals. This is his best chance. And if he does not show up in the Bucs series or he gets thoroughly outplayed by Giannis, I don't know I can give him the benefit of the doubt going forward no matter what they look like going into the playoffs. And I think that's the part of the point here is that there's a lot of pressure on the team. You know, this does feel like a big moment for them, but the path is just so, and I don't want to say easy because the, I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to disrespect the Knicks, disrespect the Bucks. But I think as far as a two and a three seed go, those teams are dealing with more turmoil than your average two and three seed. The OG Ananobi injury and coming back from that Julius Randle injury, the Giannis injury and all of the chaos that they've had. That's just abnormal for a team that is in the second and third position. And so Philly having an opportunity to go through there to get to Boston. And then if you get to Boston, look, it's a tough matchup defensively because Embiid's going to be out on the perimeter. They spread you out. But offensively, Al Horford can't guard him. Sam Hauser can't guard him. Porzingis can't guard him. So at least you can make the argument of it's a tough matchup on one side, but on the other side, you should be able to control what you can control. And if you get there, that's as best as you can hope for, and you have nothing to lose at that point. It's rare to be able to make a run to a conference finals and have nothing to lose. They could find themselves in that position, and that's a good position to be. So I just look at it and I say, for all the adversity Philadelphia has faced this year with Embiid missing so much time, Melton missing so much time, this all the injuries they've had, they are in a great spot to make a run here, and I think I think they're ready to take advantage of it based on what I'm seeing from Embiid. Uh, any final thoughts on them before we move on? Wait a second. Jay Walk. Let me call Jay Walk out. I see this comment. Legs talking crazy. <laughs> ain't, no way, ain't no way he believes Joel averaged 19 points. I didn't say he was going to average 19 points again. He said if. I, say that. I yeah. said if, 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 and yeah. I don't believe he's going. I just picked them to win the damn series. Pay attention. Yeah. I said, if for, he does not, if he underperforms, if that were to yeah. happen, I said, he's going to have a very difficult time convincing anyone to give him the benefit of the doubt going forward. I don't think right. that's going to happen. I think he's going to be the most dominant player in the series. And also, I really believe in my heart, Maxi statistically has a better series than Damian Lillard yeah. in that series because of who's going to be guarding him. He's going to have either yeah. Malik Beasley or Damian Lillard. Tyrese Maxey. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Thing. What are we talking do about? do his thing against those guys. I'm telling you. And he's just, yeah, he's just so confident. His confidence doesn't waver, man. He could come out yeah. to over five in the first quarter and still get 30 on a given night. Yeah. And the guys that played that spot before Philadelphia, that was not the case. They missed the first three shots. It was a different night for them in a playoff game. That's not yeah. Tyrese Maxey. So, that, that, you know, I don't know people sometimes, you just, just don't take things out of context. Listen to the whole statement. Right. I didn't say Embiid's averaging 19. I said if he he has had series though where he didn't play well in his in his career. If he has one of those, another one of those, and I can list some if you want. Like go back to the Toronto series, you yeah. know, I can list some. And if he has another one of those that replicates one of those, what I'm saying now, and he's healthy, you got a problem. Then and yeah. gonna have a problem convincing people that he doesn't have some issue in the postseason. This is his shot, I believe, to get to the conference finals. And look, if they went if they beat the Bucks, the Knicks. And they're feeling really good about themselves. Maxie's playing great. And Bede's playing great. I got news for you, man. That would be a hell of a series against Boston. That's not going to be some easy series if, they, if it gets to that point. Yeah. There you go. A little roast of Jay in the chat. I love it. Uh, all right. Let's take a break. On the other side, we got to get to some of these other games. We're almost going to go rapid fire. We'll talk about this Bucks game. We'll talk about the Giannis injury. We'll also get to the Suns performance. Legs, every time you say something nice about the Suns, 
they reward you with the worst performance of all time. We'll get to that. <laughs> Warriors beat the Lakers. Rockets beat the Magic. So many games to get to today on the All-NBA Show. But first, let me tell you about Manscaped. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped. But did you know one man every hour, every day is di diagnosed with testicular cancer? In fact, testicular cancer is the most common form of cancer amongst men aged 15 to 35. Our, one of our biggest demographics. With April being National Testicular Cancer, Cancer Awareness Month, our friends over at Manscaped have partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to help spread awareness for men's health and early cancer detection. Visit manscaped.com slash TCS to learn how to check yourself for early signs of cancer. And as always, you can use the promo code ALLMBA for 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Of course, they've got that Lawnmower 5.0. They also have a whole pack where you get several of their things, including a nose trimmer. The All of their things are waterproof. You can shave in the shower, in the bath, or even in the ocean. And right now, they're doing it all for a good cause. So head on over to manscaped.com slash TCS. Also want to tell you about our presenting sponsor, DraftKings Sportsbook. The NBA season is in full swing. The playoffs are getting ready. We have, right after this uh, episode, we are going to start dropping. So at uh, this episode ends at 11.30 Mountain Time. It's at 1.30 Eastern Time. Immediately after that, we will have our first end of season awards video going live. It's going to be most improved player. You're going to want to check all of those out. We'll be dropping one after every show for the rest of the week. Uh, and if you want to place a bet on who you think is going to win based on what Legler tells you, who he thinks should win, then you can head over to DraftKings Sportsbook and lay down a bet. It's official sports betting partner of the NBA. Right now, new customers bet 5 bucks and get 150 instantly in bonus bets only on DraftKings Sportsbook. Again, you bet 5 bucks, Whether you win or lose, you can win $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code ALLNBA. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 and over, age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash b ball for eligibility and deposit restrictions terms and responsible gaming resources all right back here on the all nba show make sure to throw us a like if you're watching it live leave a comment if you're not and subscribe to the channel we have great stuff coming up for you all week and then going into next week as we head to the playoffs let's move on to the bucks and the celtics the bucks get the win 104 91 only 91 points for the celtics they were short-handed uh missing porzingis but this game, only 91 points for the Celtics. Does this mean anything, Legs? The Celtics had nothing to play for. The Bucs desperately needed a win. Did this mean something? First of all, I would say this is maybe the one team, unless it's Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown, it, it, it shorthanded doesn't apply because they still had both of those guys, Derek White and Drew Holiday. I mean, yeah. they, they have, so 91 points because um, Porzingis on play, I, I don't buy into it. It's the weirdest game I've watched. Anybody wasn't paying attention to this. It's mind blowing. These two teams, who are for the most part regarded as the top two teams in the East all year, I know Milwaukee struggle now, and it's an open conversation now. But for the most part, that's who it's been. This is a late game, late season game. I didn't even know if Boston was going to play these guys. I, I I would not have been shocked if they sat all of them. To be honest with you, what's what's the point? You know, a fifteen game right. lead. They played them. I was kind of surprised in the game. Adam, two free throws were attempted in the entire game. Total, the Boston yep. Celtics did not attempt a free throw. There were five free throws taken in the All Star game. There were two. <laughs> there were two free that. throws taken. In, there was two free throws taken in this game. Okay, it's inexplicable. Now, part of it is because, and the, and again, look, part of it, the seriousness with which Boston approached this game. I don't know how you get yourself into the right frame of mind with a fifteen game lead. Okay, I don't know. This this is a very difficult thing for Missoula to navigate and how they're trying to handle this. Um, but you took 52 threes out of 93 shots. 52, even by their standards, it's it's an outrageous number of threes. So we take that many threes, clearly you're not going to get fouled much, but still, you would still think of the other 41 two-point shots they took, somebody was getting hit at some point, or you get a bump out of the perimeter when you're in the bonus None of this happened. The entire game for the Boston Celtics, a very weird thing. Bucks clearly outplayed them. They got on them big early, and it never really was in doubt. And then the only thing that 
added any drama to the game whatsoever. It was Giannis pulling up, uh, just jogging up the court, completely untouched, and just grabbed his leg, went down, looked like he was in shock, was looking down on his leg. I didn't think Achilles right away because that's a totally different reaction. Guys typically know that immediately. He, more he pain, too. Like he, he seemed like light pain almost, you know, more, yeah, more shock. but it was like he, he, he kind of was like, what the hell just happened? I go, nobody was near me. And he and he grabbed his calf and said, anyway, he's got a calf strain. I don't know what degree it is. It clearly, obviously, they're grateful it wasn't worse with the Achilles or something like that. But a calf strain, man, Adam, this could be serious. Like, this could be something that lingers for a while. It could just take a little while even to get back to where they're comfortable clearing him to play. Right. And then once he does, is it something that he's going to be limited by or it resurfaces or what's going to happen. But clearly right now, I think it's thrown some uncertainty into what the, uh, the Bucks and Giannis are going to look like in the postseason. A hundred percent. It's so scary for them. And I'm with you. Like when I saw it, I've just seen so many people tear their Achilles and his, it wasn't even anything he did. It was his reaction. It, it wasn't like the movement. It wasn't this, it was just his reaction looked different for whatever that's worth. Today's news when it drops, which will probably be in the afternoon after the team gets MRIs and everything, it's going to be the, one of the biggest stories of the year because we're a week away from the playoffs. And if he is injured in any capacity that would limit him, all bets are off for that Milwaukee Bucks team who is yeah. already reeling. So it's such a big, it's such a big one. But at least they got the win, legs. As low of a bar as this was to clear, and as weird as a game it is where there was only two foul shots, I feel like the Bucks just needed anything to kind of stop the bleeding, and at least they got it. Adam. I hear you. Everything, everything you're saying is completely true. I just keep getting back to wrapping my head. I watched the entire game. It wasn't like I saw this box score. I was like, damn, okay, right. that's weird. Let me go watch the condensed version of the game and see if I can figure out what happened. I watched the entire game, and I don't understand how the Milwaukee Bucks were called for four personal fouls <laughs> in a 48-minute game against the Celtics. Like what, explain what you, yeah. it. Well, what it's do you think bizarre. that means? What do you what do you think? Was it not as, as aggressive? Was the game not intense enough or physical enough? It didn't. That's that's what's that's what's crazy about it. It didn't feel like that to me. Like I've seen a lot of games this year where it was almost like there was a handshake agreement at the start of the game. Hey, we're right. not going to guard each other or touch each other, right? Everybody good with that? Let's go. I've seen games like that this year where I was like, man, oh man, that didn't even feel like I was watching the NBA. I didn't get that vibe from this game. Other than I did, as I usually do when I watch the Celtics, at one point in the game, just say, my goodness, they take a lot of threes. Like It's like they come down five, six trips in a row, and it's the first half decent three they get. They shoot it, and I keep saying, this could be the one thing that they could be vulnerable with, man, in an important spot. Like They go cold on a given night. That's a pivotal point in the series It's because they don't have to do it. That's the thing. They've got so many guys that can break you down. They can play another way anytime they want. So that's, I guess, the one thing. I, yeah, I noticed they were taking even more than they normally take from the perimeter, and they were taking quick ones. But four fouls committed yeah. by an NBA team in a game, especially when you're talking about this wasn't like this wasn't like you know Spurs Grizzlies like you know, two teams playing for nothing last night that just weren't going to touch anybody because they want to go home for the summer. These two teams are expecting to make deep playoff runs. And they're playing each other late in the year, and everybody's pretty much out there, and you uh, you don't touch anybody. It was a very, very bizarre. You know, uh, you're not going to see. I thought uh, the UConn Purdue box score. I said the next morning, I'll never see another box score like that in my life. Um, in college basketball, a team with one made three, and one player getting an assist from a team, only one player registering an assist from a team. That's just, it's not basketball. That doesn't make any sense to me. This box yeah. score, I never see this again. Yeah. In fact, it's in a record, right? I believe it, they, it's a record setting lack of free throws since the, since they started tracking this, like in the sixties, I guess they went back to the mid sixties. Um, they asked Patrick Beverly about it after the game. And he's like, I don't know, man, it's above my pay grade. He said, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. And he goes, I don't go to the foul line anyway. So it doesn't matter. Don't ask me. But it just that's the biggest takeaway for me for the game. It's gonna I'm gonna have be scratching my head about this for years. How I was watched a game with four fouls committed by a team and two free throws shot in the entire game. I don't I don't understand. Are you suggesting and I, I'm not I'm giving you the opportunity here. Are you suggesting something nefarious here? Or is it just as the the officiating this year has been so bizarre? Everything was a foul for a while, now maybe nothing. Like 
Are, are, do you think there's something like more off? Like it's actually bothering you that this game occurred this way? No, it, I, I, other than I will say like there was time, and this happens a lot too. I don't think the officiating overall is as good as it's been in the league. I, I don't. Yeah. I, I think I think as a former player watching these games, um, I, I just don't think the quality is quite there um, the way that it used to be. I don't. And so I did see some stuff last night that I kind of thought that way too about, but it wasn't like guys were getting – all kinds of contact, you know, at the rim or something on drives. And I'm going, my God, they swallowed their whistle tonight. It wasn't like that. Um, so maybe, you know, you go back and watch it again and, and maybe I'd have to watch it a second time to try to understand. Maybe they called it exactly how it was supposed to be called. There wasn't legitimate fouls being committed on these, on the finishing of these drives, man. But it was, I don't know. No, I don't. I, I wish I had a reason. I don't because I did watch it and I have no explanation for it. And I, I know, I'm going to tell you this too. When the game ended, Adam, and they might have talked about it in the broadcast with the last few minutes to go, that kind of raised my awareness. If the game had ended and I didn't hear them comment on this, and you asked me after the game how many free throws were shot in that game, I probably would have said, yeah, you know what, not a lot. Probably like yeah. maybe 12, 15. Yeah. I would have never said two. I would have said, no, that's impossible. I just watched the game. What are you talking about? Yeah. It's just – it's a really, really weird night, weird game, and, and honestly the only thing to really take from it Celtics shoot a dangerous amount of three pointers yeah, for them true. and Giannis. That's, that's all you take out of this game. What's up with Giannis? And is this something we're going to be talking about going forward? Well, speaking of weird box scores, the Phoenix Suns fall to the LA Clippers <laughs> 105 to 92. And in first quarter legs, the final <laughs> score was 37 to 10, but even that hides it. There was two field goals made, both of them by Drew Eubanks uh, on the Sun side. Nobody else hit a field goal. Six points were off of free throws, four off of field goals. The Suns, they, they've been playing pretty good lately. Like Devin Booker, we just talked about. I like what we're seeing from them, this or that. But they just have these games too often that you never want to go full Suns. You never want to go all in on them because of nights like last night. What the heck happened in this game? Something else. I'll go out on a line and a limb here and say, when, and as long as we're talking about things I'll never see again. I could watch every minute of every game in the NBA will play from now until my last breath. I will never see a 35 to four start to a game again, ever. <laughs> it was 35 to four, Adam. And yep. Phoenix was at home. They were getting yeah. it taken to them at, and they were all playing Durant, Booker, Beal, Grayson Allen, Royce O'Neal, all of them. Even my man Bol Bol couldn't get it going. Like, what is the world? 35 to 4. Now, Phoenix made a run at one point. I think they, they got it to single digits, if I recall. Like, in the fourth quarter, I think Beal had a three-point play, and it got under 10. And they were getting hyped. The crowd was getting too late. It's going to be the greatest comeback in the history of the NBA. And then, of course, you run out of gas, as typically happens, and uh, and the Clippers pulled away. This Clippers have beat them three times this year, by the way, um, or maybe four last night. That might be the fourth time they beat them. No, uh, I think they, they play tomorrow. They played them or tonight. Oh, or that's tomorrow. what it is. They if they beat them three, tonight would be four if they beat them at home. Um, look, it, it's the Suns. It, 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 I'm not going to say that typifies their season because that's incredibly extreme. But I think the point is the inconsistency with which the Suns' season has gone. That was just another example of it. It's an important game for them at home. It, and it kind of reminded you what Luka did to them in an important game at home in a game seven of a playoff series when it was a 30 point game in the second quarter. It felt like that, like it, cause this was an important game for both teams. And yet here was Phoenix just coming out and getting absolutely trucked from the beginning. Um, and I take, I take more out of the, them getting down 31 than I do their comeback, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think so too. And it's just, it's why it's so hard to buy the Phoenix suns. The suns and bucks to me have very similar things going on in that, there are the X's and O's of a team. There's the chemistry of a team. There's all this stuff. And then it is just this, does the team seem like they have the belief and excitement and joy and all those things? And this Suns team, man, I they play well because they're so talented. So they play well at times. They had a third, what was that? What did they score in the third quarter? 35 point third 35. quarter. They have these moments where they play great, but they just don't seem like a team that, to me, they don't seem like a team that is excited for the next two and a half months run to a, to uh, a final. That probably that take is probably the best summation of how I feel about the Phoenix Suns. They're, they're, they yeah. they just don't seem that into this 
yeah. like connected to this. Like some of these teams and some of the players on those teams, it seems like they would literally cut off their arm to have a chance to win a yep. game. And I don't feel that way about the Phoenix Suns, man. I just don't. And it's hard to buy in. So, and let's see, it looks like now for them, are they, they're, they're seven now, right? So probably going to end up there. They're going to be in a play-in game, most likely against the Sacramento Kings. I think that's how it's going to end up for them. And they'll probably get that game at home. Yeah. And I, you have to feel good about them winning that one with the Lakers losing, you know, that's less likely now that they move up to the eight, but you never know, or you never know. Phoenix probably gets in and they probably play a, you know, a tough team in the second, in the first round, Denver, Minnesota, or Oklahoma city, all of those good teams. And they're capable of winning them. But I mean, the team is so frustrating They're To me, they're one of the more frustrating teams, like good teams that you get this year. And it's not even like, cause I just hate the Suns or this or that, but because they're so, as you mentioned, you want a team that seems like eager to run into the, the, the battle eager to kind of take on the challenge. And this team has nights like last night where they score four points. Let me ask you a real quick question. One last thing on this game. And, and, you know, and this could be a longer discussion, obviously. So I'm going to ask you to make something that could be complicated, simple, but look, the, the year they've had, we've just described it. Last night was galling, galling. You should have heard the booze when um they, they had four points forever and I think Booker went to the line to give them five and six late, like a minute left in the quarter. And they got a mock, like basically a mock standing ovation. Okay. Because they got six on the board and there was 35 at that point. Or it might've been 37 at that point. And I'm saying to myself, man, oh man, oh man, this is the kind of visual that can get somebody fired. And I know, I know Frank Vogel's only been there mm. one year, but I'm just saying, man, if, if they, if they, Go out with a whimper. They lose the seven eight. Then they lose the eight. Not they lose the next game yeah, to Golden okay. State or something, and and they don't even make it to the playoffs. That's a problem. Or let's say they get out and they're a seven or an eight seed and they get beaten five games by Denver. They get beaten not five close, games yeah. by Minnesota. And what do you think, man? I think I think somebody he might be in trouble. And I love Frank Vogel. I do. I, he's a great guy, great man. I think he's a good coach. But it's just it's hard with that much talent to have that kind of year and like that on top and have that kind of visceral moment where you're down 31 points in the first quarter at home. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah, I think uh, – let me ask you this one. What about – because that's the consequence of guys who could lose their job or what have you. But a team giving you a mock standing ovation, the booze raining down at home, getting humiliated like that, what effect do you think that has on the team this late in the season? Forget the standing. Forget that part of it. Just – what do you think this does for a, a Phoenix team to get booed like that by their home crowd? You know, look, man, some of these guys will probably be able to rise above that. But I think overall, collectively, I think it does have an effect coming out. And that's not like playing poorly, man. That's completely not being prepared to play a game. That's the only way you can you can explain being down 35 to 4 at home with that kind mm -hmm. of talent on, on your team. That does that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That's mentally not being ready. And then and then once you're down 10, 12, 14, and you're going, oh, damn, okay. Wow. It's like, you know, it's it's kind of we always joke like boxers, you know, they hear that ding ding for round one. They come out, they dance around a little bit. Well, this was like ding ding, and the dude sprinted across the ring and started throwing haymakers at you. Okay, at some point you get away from that guy and you like you catch your breath, like, okay, you know, I guess I gotta start fighting here. And it's like they didn't respond yeah. then even. That's my point. Yeah. They still yeah, went six great, trips in a row without doing anything offensively. And it's like, wow, man. So I do think that can have like a little bit of a lingering effect because that was absolutely humiliating. Let's see how they answer tonight. They're playing the same team. They're playing the same team after what just happened to them. And now they change venues. Let's see. I think they're changing venues. Is that game in, in LA? Um, let us know. Sometimes actually, here. the same city twice in a row. So uh, weird, man. The no, it's at LA. Yeah, it's, it's, it's at LA. So – they got now they played them at home. They got smoked. Let now they got to go play them at the Clippers home court. Let's see what happens. If they have some fight, get a win, maybe they can brush it off. I don't know, but it was that was embarrassing. Let's move over to the Warriors beating the Lakers. This is the battle of the 9-10. This is an interesting one because these two teams could very well match up next Tuesday in the first game of the play-in. But the Warriors get the win in this one, 134 to 120. I don't know if there's two players in the history of the NBA who have played each other as frequently as LeBron James and Steph Curry have gone at each other, but this is the latest. Uh, what stood out to you about this one? Uh, look, Warriors were sharp. They were very sharp in this game. You know, Lakers sharp. didn't have Anthony Davis, uh, and that's 
you know, against this team in particular, that's a big deal because that that's Golden State's problem by right? dealing with the size. They look small when they played the Lakers in the past. That you know, they got really dominated by them last year in the playoffs. So AD didn't play. LeBron was like, you know, I guess under the weather, although he had a very good game, and I didn't notice anything about him that looked under the weather, but that's what they reported before the game. He goes out with 33, 7, and 11, so he had a hell of a game. I just thought the Warriors were super crisp, very crisp. And they made 26 threes, man. They shot 63% from the three-point line. So that exposed some of the Lakers' issues. But more than anything, it was a Warriors uh, typical – Curry era Warriors offense, a ton of movement, super decisive um, plays on the perimeter, ton of dribble handoffs, ton of ton of screen action, ton of pace up the floor, make or miss, every right read, um, and they shot the hell out of the ball. And Draymond was six for six. Or no, Draymond was five for seven. Made his first five threes, by the way, which is obviously an anomaly. Um, but everybody played with great confidence. Clay got it going. I just was so impressed with how crisp they looked and the rate of their offense. And they've now put up major numbers against the Lakers every time they've played them this year. Yeah, they can score. They're averaging, let me see here, over 30 assists, 30 and a half assists in the last month and a half of the season. Uh, and they get 37 last night. That's what you're talking about with Warriors basketball. For them, it's been the story their whole era they turned the ball over a lot, even last night, 15. That's 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 one of their Achilles heels, but the the that's the cost of the 37 assists that you get when the ball moves that much, and they've been doing it. They are one two-point loss to the Mavericks away from a nine-game winning streak, legs. They I, I don't really buy them. I, have, I haven't bought them all year, but they are playing their best basketball. And this was a yeah. game that this is a game that was interesting because it ties them basically in the loss column with the Lakers. It's still possible that they could host the first round of a play-in series against the Lakers, which would be, to me, a big deal, you know, in terms of trying to win the odds. So the Warriors, not counting them out yet, just yet, Legs. I, I think I'm well, 90% out on them. I, I, I agree. And I said yesterday, and it was all over social media, I said on ESPN yesterday morning that this that they will not contend again with this core group as currently constructed. They're not going to contend. Doesn't mean they won't. Make the playoffs. They might make the playoffs the next two or three years, like as Curry winds down, maybe. Uh, but they're not going to contend. They're not going to be a team that's going to make a legitimate deep run. But you watch them last night. The one thing that stood out to me last night, too, was I've watched the Warriors so many games this year, and I don't think I've seen a game um, other than last night where all of the principal characters played well on the same night. Normally, they've won games where uh, Curry played great, and maybe they got a pretty good game out of Kaminga. But then Wiggins struggled. Clay struggled. Draymond was just okay. Everybody. You know, Kaminga's the only guy that didn't do much last night, but he's just coming back from an injury. He's still coming off the bench. Wiggins was 7 for 12. Clay was 10 for 16. Steph was 7 for 9. Draymond was 5 for 7 with 5 threes. Chris Paul was 5 for 10 for 11 points. Pajemski was 5 for 6. All of their principal scorers had really efficient nights, and that just hasn't happened very often for them this year. So that's, I'm saying, a great sign for them that maybe they've, you know, we're clicking exactly the way they need to at the right time. Yeah. Let's move on to another one. This one is a disappointing loss for the uh, Orlando Magic. The Rockets have been on that losing streak. Their season is over, and yet they get a little dead cat bounce here. 118-106 win over the Orlando Magic. And this one is especially tough because the Magic, had spent all year climbing the standings and finally reaching the three seed. It was theirs to hold on to, and they drop a game against a team that was eliminated. This is a tough one for the Magic, man. Very disappointing, and I just want – I think it maybe does it kind of like basically sum up what we feel the Magic are at this point because this was a huge game for them. You got the Bucks playing the Celtics, and look, going into the night, you know, if you're the Magic, you might be thinking, hey, you know, the way the Bucs have been playing, Boston's got a great chance to win that game. If they beat the Rockets and the Bucs lose, they're tied, and they play the Bucs twice in the last three games of the season. Yeah. So you literally control everything to get the two seed potentially. So a huge, now, look, as it turns out, the Bucs won. Fine. Well, then win and stay within one game of them and yeah. then win the two games against the Bucs. And, again, you control – whether you can be too. So I felt like this was the biggest game of the year for them. 
and your Rockets were red hot recently, but then that ended and it kind of, you know, now we know they're going home for the summer. I felt like this is a game, man. You want to make a statement about what kind of year you've had and this hasn't been some fluky thing? Like you guys are then win this game and they did it. Yeah. And it's, so I was, I was disappointed for them because now, you know, they're not going to have a chance to catch the Bucs. And actually there's a very good chance now they don't get three either. So there's a very good chance they end up in the four or five spot when you had a chance. I believe you win that game, you got a real shot at two. And maybe even in the five spot, because as you mentioned, now they're tied with the Cavs. So you could even go on the road. You can even fall back down to six this late since the Pacers are only, what, one game behind. So that even that's possible. It's a tough one for them to lose. You know who I blame the legs? I blame all of the Magic fans who told us it was the dumbest question we've ever asked when we said Houston or Orlando, who has the better young core? So yeah. many Mavs fans that were so offended by the very question of it, even though you picked the Magic, even yeah, though you cited on the Magic. Well, it just goes game. to my point I made earlier with that guy that you know you're not, they don't listen well enough, yeah. man. You're, <laughs> you're not, maybe maybe they they're, 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 they got us on, but yeah. then they're watching a movie. You know they're doing a crossword yeah, yeah. puzzle. I don't know what they're doing, but they're not they're not really tuned in because yeah, I I said yeah. I'd take the magic. Yeah, it's it's fans love righteous indignation. I even see the chat today is popping yeah. off. Not about what we're talking about. There's a lot of MVP conversation and debate back and forth, and I'm telling you, fans like nothing more than righteous indignation. Uh, Pacers beat the Raptors last night, 140 to 123. You wanted to talk about them because your text to me was, "Are we sleeping on the Pacers? What do you what do you mean by that?" Yeah, man, I just, I just, I just they're, they're not, now, not only are they, are they not going away? Look at the way that this team has been playing now here over the last few weeks. And they've had a kind of a wild roller coaster ride this year, but they are now eight and three in their last 11 games. I mean, they're, they're continuing to just win games and they, they're putting up big numbers and do it. And I know Toronto's not playing for anything, but they scored 140 points on them. They had 117 against Miami, 126 in their win against Oklahoma City. That's three in a row against those teams. Um, so I just think, again, like I, I don't want to just talk all about the Eastern Conference all the time. And we, I feel like we do when we mention a lot of teams and we never mention them. And we'll look yeah. up and it's like, well, there they are. They still have a shot at five in the East. Certainly six, avoid the play-in altogether and be one of the hotter teams in the Eastern Conference going into the playoffs with a difficult style to defend. I just – just want people be aware. I'm just trying to. I'm not. Look, I'm not going at her saying they're going to make it to the conference finals or anything like that. Or challenge. But I'm just saying let's not uh, exclude them when we talk about teams in the East. Because I think beyond Boston, all these damn teams are capable of beating each other, and Indiana's mm. in that mix too. Yeah. Let's move on to tonight's games though there are a couple other games that happened last night we're gonna have to skip over them though because tonight there's two huge marquee matchups the first one bucks in the magic this one maybe has some of the wind taken out of the sail because of you know whatever's going on with Giannis last night but it's still a big one for both of those teams and, and for their seating do you what are, what are you looking for in this game I, I guess it's hard to ask because we don't know the honest piece of this but I assume no matter what he's out tonight so what are you looking yeah, for I, I can't there's no way he's playing tonight and yeah. I, you know, even if he felt really good, the fact that they He's now have a two game, two game cushion on them instead of one ma matters. So I, I don't think no matter what he's not playing. So I think, look, same thing I said about the magic last night, the magic could still, they could still find their way to get to two or three. And certainly they've got two against the bucks to control a lot of that and put the bucks behind them. So that's still a big game for them. I think for Milwaukee, it's and we've seen nights like this when Giannis hasn't played. Lillard has been able to look like Dame from Portland. Like that's when I think the best version of Damian we've seen all year is when Giannis hasn't played. So let's see if uh, Lillard can dial that up once again. But th th this stuff mathematically is too complicated, Adam. With all these tiebreakers and everything else, I can't I wait until Sunday night, man, about six o'clock when all these games are over and we actually know what the playing looks like, what the matchups look like, because right now. Um, there's just way too much movement that can take place with any of these games, and that's one of them. And then the big one that we do know, uh, you know, should yeah. have full squads outside of Carl Anthony Towns, who's working his way back, but will not be playing tonight. The Timberwolves are in Denver to take on the Nuggets. This one will all but determine the one seed. There's still a chance the team could lose this one and still win out, but almost, but very unlikely. I think whoever wins tonight's matchup will end up being the number one seed in the Western Conference. What do you expect from this one, Legs? What are, what are you looking for? 
Uh, well, look, Anthony Edwards had an amazing night last night, career high. You know, he expended a lot to get that win, to put them in this position where this game is going to yep. mean so much. But here's what it comes down to for me. You, you don't trust anybody more than the Nuggets in a spot like this. It's that mm. simple. Now, Aaron Gordon's not playing, correct? Well, he didn't play last night, but I don't think he's been ruled out today. Okay. Okay. Well, I hope he does play. I, ho I hope, you know, we get a chance to see that because I think in a big spot, got to win it based on execution. I think it'll be a close game. You know, I don't trust anybody more than the Denver Nuggets to get it done. And like I said, I don't know if I said it to you or I said it to somebody else I was having a conversation with about the number one seed. I said, I don't think Mike Malone necessarily even thought they were going to get the one seed if you asked him six weeks yeah. ago. Right? right, but but now now he's like he's kind of like one of those situations where you go, well, damn, if you're going to give it to us, I guess we'll take it, because that's what this is now. It's like basically control home court throughout the Western Conference playoffs. I don't think it was something that was a priority for them all year, and I think your priorities change once you've won a championship. You look at the season differently. And it's just normal. I think that's what they did. But yet, despite all of that. You look up, and here they are, the chance to win this game and really kind of grab hold of the one seed. So go ahead and do it, and I think that's the kind of effort you're going to get out of the Denver Nuggets. I'm curious, man, because last night Jokic was asked about the game. It was it was funny, a contrast. Anthony Edwards scores 51 points, and he's asked about the matchup with Denver. And he called it the game of the year, most important game, biggest game. And then Jokic was asked about it, and he says, I don't know why everybody's acting like it's a big game. It's not a big deal at all. And the one seed is cool and all, but we don't really care. I hate that Jokic does that. I love Yoke, but I hate that he does yeah, this where he always downplays everything and tells everyone. I hate when NBA players tell us it, something doesn't matter. I'm thinking, I, I agree. Invest my life. I invest my life in these games. I'm hanging by a, a thread. Yeah. So many fans are hanging by a thread game by game, and you tell us it doesn't actually matter. Nonetheless, downplay it all you want, Yoke. Tonight's a big game. I Yeah, he's I'm not going to get a this. job. He's not going to get a job with NBA PR anytime soon, man. That's for sure. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but that's look, we know that's who he is, man. That's his demeanor. He's all about that. Like he's even said like, you know, when it's all when his career is all said and done, he just wants to go off somewhere, live in the country, and never be bothered again. Like that's just who yeah. Jokic is, man. And he's going to do the same with this game. But we all know it's a big game. It's going to be, you know, highly entertaining game. And I hope it's hope it's close gives us some drama and gives us maybe a preview of what could be the conference finals, although I think my Dallas Mavericks are going to have a lot to say with that. Give me a prediction for the game tonight. Who wins? Uh, Nuggets, Nuggets will win the game. I think it'll be a one-possession game with six minutes to go, and I think Denver, as they usually do, will uh, will execute to perfection down the stretch, and they will get every good shot that you need to get when the game's on the line because that's just pretty much what they do in pressure situations. Jamal Murray missed nine games. He came back. He's played the last two, and last night at Utah, he looked phenomenal. Uh, he looked like he was – back fully back from whatever you know leg injuries hamstring knee foot all of all of the above all right cue that outro music emma and i know we have a super chat a single super chat came in what do we have here from jonesy he says yo legs i want to say for me you the best analyst out and you explain it so clear no idea why you're not a coach respect you and how you are one of the la the last explaining ball not just stats and, and pushing agendas you about tape. So there you go. A balance out to whoever the guy was earlier. here. Like some, some R. Love. Jonesy. I love you, R. Jonesy. Appreciate the love. And, uh, man, I threw my hat in the ring for some coaching jobs, man. And, and I think that uh, – I think I could have done some things. It's not, it's, not, it's not gone yet, the dream. I might still end up in that spot one day, hopefully. Well, that'd be terrible for me, legs. I'm enjoying the podcast. I don't. No, you wouldn't. I'm... You'd be. You'd be sitting. You'd be sitting on the bench right next to Let's me. Let's go. We would, yes. We'd be. We'd be. Yeah. We'd be running our program, man. Let's doing go, our thing. Man. We could do. We could do the pod one hour a day. We'd still do the pod, and uh, but then we just go win some games at night. That's all. You know what? LeBron has a pod. He's a player. Draymond has a pod. He's a player. We need a coach. A coach with a podcast. Hey, Active hey, coach hey, one last thing. Pod. One last thing before we go, too. Emma might be the one to ask about this because she's all about the prop bets. She hasn't been giving anybody guaranteeing any money lately, which is kind of weird. Maybe she's getting maybe she's getting her handed to her on the uh on the betting lines. But tonight, Suns Clippers rematch from last night. If I were to give you the Suns plus 30 in the first quarter, would you take that bet? <laughs> Hop in here, Emma. Oh. Would you take that bet? Plus 30. For the Suns in the first quarter, because if you took it last night, you would have lost, Emma. You would have lost that bet. I know. I don't know. I don't know about tonight. I don't think I'll I'll be placing any money. I no, did actually I, I did actually place some bets to 
today though we talked before the show you bullied right. me into placing some oh uh, yeah, yeah yeah you said you were going light let's go get that let's make some money for some people yeah so we got nicole Jokic, 25 plus points Okay. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, I also took Kevin Durant 20 plus points. I'm kind of scared about that one. Uh, all right. I know. 20? And then, That's easy. Yeah, 20. And then we also have Mikhail Bridges over 15 and a half points. No, I don't care about that, but I'll tell you what. I think Jokic, <laughs> over, 20, I think Jokic over 25 is a stone cold lock. There you go. Minus man. 210 on DraftKings Sportsbook. Take it. All right. I'll hit it right after you get off the air. Everybody, great night, to, uh, great show today. It's going to be a great one tomorrow. More good games tonight. We'll see you guys over on the other side. We all silly like the mayor. 